ES Audio. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. I'm Nick Curtis. And I'm Nancy Durrant. It's just us this week as Nick Clark's off somewhere sunny in Italy. Yes, so you've got us for the next couple of weeks. Coming up on this week's show... We'll be reviewing Patriots at the Noel Coward, starring Tom Hollander and Will Keane. We are here today to urge the West to open its eyes and see that this Russia will never be a good neighbour. It will threaten the world order, it will be an enemy of freedom, and we must act now. This is a play written by The Crown's Peter Morgan, and it's directed by Rupert Gould. And earlier in the week, I caught up with Jamie Parker, who you'll know from Harry Potter and the Cursed Child as the grown-up Harry Potter, and the History Boys. We always will be associated with it. It doesn't matter how stratospheric James Corden becomes, he's still... He's still going to be a history boy still, to you. still ex-history yeah. boy. None of any of it has been a surprise to me. Whenever I've seen so-and-so crop up in whatever, you kind of go, well, that makes sense. Jamie's currently starring as Benjamin Button at the Southwark Playhouse Elephant. And we discuss A Midsummer Night's Dream at The Globe. That's directed by L. Weil. And the show also features The Globe's artistic director, Michelle Terry, who is playing Puck. Welcome back to another episode. As we said, it's just Nancy and I for the next couple of weeks as Nick Clark is off having a nice jolly time in Italy. And we're recording from the Standards TV studio today. We are. It feels very professional. Feels very grown up. Slightly weird. (laughs) Um, And I wish I'd washed my hair. But Um, that means you'll also be able to watch one of our reviews online, should you wish to. So, the big news this week is the new appointment at the Donmar Warehouse. Yes. Tim Sheeder from the Open Air Theatre in Regent's Park. Yeah, he was there for ages. He was there for ages. 16 years or something. I was like, did I get the right really long time you're replacing michael longhurst who is going from the donmar after only five years i believe um mm. and i think this is a really interesting appointment the open air theater used to be one of my least favorite theaters in london it was memorably described by another theater critic as a vast open air toilet in the middle of regent's park <laughs> it's got a bit better since it's got a bit better since then but it used to be it sort of slightly naff and touristy mm. and and a bit sort of like the theater equivalent of the royal academy summer exhibition the sort of you know Slightly Ouch. naff thing that happened every summer. But I think uh, Timothy Sheeder and his immediate predecessor really bucked it up and, mm. and you know, upped its artistic game. It was rebuilt by Howard Tompkins Architects, who, you yeah. know, the, the great magical reinventors of London theatres. It's uh, got a really lovely vibe It's now, got a terrific it? It looks vibe nice. Now. It's got this sort of gorgeous kind of... It, it's just got a really warm feel about it, yeah. even when the weather is not. Yes, which is usually the case. I mean, yeah. you know we're due for a drop in temperature when the, because the first show at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre opens every year. Uh, so, you know, due a cold snap whenever that happens, really. <laughs> but yeah, it's got a, no, it has got a lovely vibe. Anyway, I think this is really, really good news. And it's the first sort of bit of movement in the general churn of artistic directors at yeah. the sort of mid to large scale venues yeah There's yeah it's true a it's lot kind of, of absences which have been, or, you know a lot of vacant spots now which have been added to by the announcement that Indy Ruba Singham is leaving the Kiln Theatre yeah, after and so, 10 yeah, years in post 12 yeah, years in post yeah and of course there is no artistic director at the Hampstead Theatre at the moment and we don't know if there's going to be one they haven't clarified entirely what their future is going to be I think this is quite good like Tim Sheeda going to the Donmar because I don't know I just I, I feel like you know, it was five years and there were some good shows, but I, I haven't really felt a kind of buzz around um, Michael Longhurst's tenure. Yeah. For, you know, and part of that reason for that is there was a pandemic in the middle of it. And That's that makes true. it very difficult to maintain yeah. any kind of momentum. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's a freshening, I think. Very much so. And it's it's somebody with a, not to say that Michael Longhurst doesn't have a commercial eye, but Timothy Cheetah very, you know, has a, mm. an eye for big shows that work well it's interesting yeah. with Daniel well, Evans they've got a lot more space at the open theatre let's that's, face it I mean the Donmar very is titchy witchy it is titchy witchy but uh, but you know that's that's an interesting choice for him to go yeah. from a large unsubsidised theatre to go to a small I mean also the Donmar's also lost they're also now unsubsidised theatre I mean theater. they've now got no, you know that's another thing is that he's going into a, a, t- a new a, you know a new world with the Donmar and yes. it's now you know it's no longer a, um, one of the uh, what are they called for the Arts Council you know, when they've got kind of national importance. I've yes, the I name. can't remember the name of it either. Anyway, anyway, they've lost it. They haven't got any funding. Yeah. So, that you know, everything's going to have to be brought in either through ticket sales or through corporate or independent giving. And yeah. that is... 
that's a tough call. It is a tough call, and it is also an interesting thing because I think the, the the he's he pioneered a cheap ticket scheme at, at the Open Air Theatre, Tim Sheeder as well. Mm. Uh, the Donmar, one of the things that Jamie Lloyd said when he was an associate director there is the frustration of the Donmar is you see the same places all the time because the season comes out, people book in, you know, you're, yeah, it's a very yeah, that's true, but it's not the same system anymore at the Donmar. Mm. And I mean, Josie Rourke introduced the sort of pay it forward system, yeah, which is that you could buy a ticket and you could buy a ticket for someone else and it could go to someone who need who you know who couldn't afford it. Mm. And there are it is it is actually now much much easier to get a ticket at the Donmar. Yeah, you do see some of the same faces. I think people don't realise that actually it has changed quite a lot. Yeah. Um but it's not it's not going to be easy and and it's not going to be easy not to fall back on that as well because yes. there's no money left. Yes, yes, very true. And we also don't know what uh, who's going into the royal court. So we wait we watch this space for the other things. I know theaters. it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a dance. It is a bit of a dance. Anyway, anyway. should we get into our first review? Yeah, absolutely. This is Patriots at the Noel Coward Theatre. Nick, do you want to kick us off? So this is um, Peter Morgan's play about the relationship between Boris Berezovsky and uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Berezovsky was uh, one of the prime oligarchs who was in on the sort of um, sell-off of the Russian state's assets towards the end of the Yeltsin era. Yeah. Um, and certainly it is Morgan's thesis that he was the man who helped put Putin mm. into the Kremlin as a sort of place man and someone he could manipulate how wrong he was, well, as quite. it turned out. This play started at the Almeida. Rupert Gould's production has transferred to the West End. A lot of attention focused on Tom Hollander as Berezovsky in the original run. Quite rightly so, but I felt back then, and I feel again even more strongly now, that Will Keane deserves equal billing um, mm. for his Putin, who starts off as this sort of rather nervy, jittery, badly dressed man with a bad haircut yeah. and ends up... As in, Vladimir Putin. As Vladimir Putin, <laughs> yes. Um, I think, you know, in my review back for the Almeida, I said he, he sort of hardens like a conquer in the oven over the sort of two and a half hours of the play. <laughs> so true. He um, won Best Supporting Actor at the Olivier's for, his, for this turn. And I remember at the time I was a bit like, oh, okay. And I had seen it, but yeah. it had been a while before. And I'd forgotten actually how good that performance is. Listeners might know him as the head of the magisterium in his Dark Materials. Yes. And he sort of channels some of that like deeply sinister vibe, I think, doesn't that he? That dark, Here. glassy eyed energy. Yeah. He has there's, an there's, air uh, of suppressed violence. Exactly. But there's also a sort of that bit of righteousness about him, you know, yeah. about his Putin, which again is a bit the same as Hugh in his Dark Materials, that sort of strident belief that your actions are entirely driven by, in this case, patriotism and a sort of fatherly strictness that it's for the good of the people. Yes. No matter how deranged or plain illegal what you find yourself doing might become. And yeah. there's that kind of sense that you are the state and therefore if you conceive of doing something, then it must be right. It must be okay. Yeah. Which is, you know, psychotic. But he really nails that, I yeah. think. It's an important thing as well that um, Berezovsky considers himself a patriot as well. And oh, he yeah. sees himself as saving Russia through capitalism yeah. at uh, considerable personal gain to himself, obviously. Yeah. I mean, um, I think Tom Holland is so great. He's him. terrific in this. He's, he's sort of really likably good. outrageous. His candor is really disarming, even when he's trying to bribe officials. Yeah. You know, he's sort of very funny. He's very foul-mouthed. But it, it's interesting, you see, these two men who really believe that they are doing everything because they love Russia so much. Yes. And it's perfectly clear that there are also other kind of self-interested yeah. uh, factors at, at stake. And everyone else can see that, but yes. they just cannot believe it. It's really interesting. Yeah, this is Peter Morgan doing again what he does so well in The Crown and The Queen and the dramas he's written about Tony Blair and Frost Nixon, which is distilling a great piece of drama from world events and addressing world events through deeply flawed personalities, yeah. I think. Um, He's not really interested in black and white. There's a play full of grey areas mm. that, for all that Putin is very obviously the villain of the piece, yeah. uh, Berezovsky is also not exactly a white knight in this, is he? You know, no, he's, absolutely he's, not. And I mean, you know, there's a sort of question of opportunity of what you would do. You know, you can you think you know that these people are all capable of doing, frankly, quite terrible things yeah. in the name of their own patriotism slash self-interest and and it's only really a question of opportunity yes <laughs> that, that stops it from from being worse yeah. i think and i mean when you talk about gray areas i think um you know luke salon's character of rome you may have heard of him that's a really interesting thing because you're kind of watching him try to bridge the gap between these two people but yes he never says a word about 
you know, about the Russian people. He doesn't bother to express any of that yeah. stuff. He just gets on with it and does what's required of him. And he is the one, actually, who puts his hand in his pocket when he's a, a regional governor. And my God, regional is the word. It's right, like the middle of yes. absolutely nowhere. Yeah. He's there for about like eight years or something. That's right. Puts his hand in his pocket, builds schools, you know, does all of this stuff, which is exactly what he knows that Putin expects him to do. Yeah. And is rewarded. Yes, um, yes. But, you know, he's he's probably, arguably, he's the one out of the three of them who actually does anything material. Although for there, anybody is, there is one other patriot in this, which is Alexander Litvinenko. Oh, who, yes, of course. Uh, is initially sort of set upon to, well, he's investigating a car bomb uh, mm. that almost kills Berezovsky and Berezovsky's driver's yeah. head lands in his lap after the, the yeah, carbon. Yeah, that was quite a line. <laughs> quite, quite grim, yeah. Like a melon, he said yes. to me, yes. Um, yeah. But Litvinenko holds himself up as the only sort of honest member of the FSB, the security service. And he yeah. believes in Russia, he believes in justice. Um, he ends up, when he's sort of set to target Berezovsky by his bosses, leaving, going over to the other side, looking after yeah. uh, Berezovsky. But he also believes he's operating for the good of Russia. And yeah. we all know what happens to him. Well, quite bizarrely, I was sitting directly behind uh, Marina Litvinenko mm. on press night, yeah. uh, which absolutely blew my friend's mind, as yeah. you can imagine. And I know she's been very supportive of the production, but it must be so weird kind of watching scenes of herself played by uh, stephanie martini i think yeah, this time yeah. um updating boris on the phone on her husband's horrific decline yes yes i mean it just it was you know and she the was, second time she's seen it because yeah. the old vic there was very british poison very english poison wasn't yes it? Which, yeah uh, exactly which again dealt with and she will have been at the almeida as well and i just sort of think you know good god what an existence yeah it's incredibly timely isn't it this transfer it was only 11 months ago that it opened at the almeida but it yeah. already feels more prescient somehow. I know, and know, it would have been being waiting. written when yes. w before the, the 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 current conflict in Ukraine. Yep, yep, yeah. And there are there are. I, I don't know if any lines have been changed because I didn't have a script on hand uh, when we saw it last night. But um, there's a line from Putin saying that um, Berezovsky gave fifty million to the Orange Revolution. You know, yeah. betraying our country, meaning meaning Ukraine. Russia specifically. Well, meaning Ukraine, oh, yes. betraying, betraying Russia by allowing Ukraine yeah. to. To secede. To splinter, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it does feel, it feels incredibly timely. But it's also really exciting, isn't it? I mean, it's it's a a, I'd forgotten how good it is, yeah, actually. I yeah. really had. And it's really, it's funny and yes. it's fun and it's zingy and it moves fast. Occasionally you get those moments of someone like, essentially explaining something to the person who knows about there it. There is a but lot, yes, there's a lot. There's, yes. there's a lot to get into, there's to There's a lot be fair. to get through. There's <laughs> a lot of history and a lot of information to be, yeah, to exactly. be imparted. And, 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 as, and I think, you know, Boris Berezovsky, Tom Holland has a speech at the beginning and at the end just explaining to Westerners how little they understand Russia. Yeah. And that's true. Like, that is absolutely 100. Like, that's really true. I think yes. we don't really know the country's history particularly well. We're yeah. very rarely taught it properly at school. And we certainly do not understand the kind of, well, I mean, I could say the sort of the culture, the, the cultures, you know, as they point out, it's got 11 time zones, it's got 150 million people. It's yeah. absolutely so bloody nationalities. massive absolutely nationalities, massive. languages, yeah. types of people. You know, we're a tiny island. I remember. And we can't conceive of that, of the Russian mindset no, at I all. It's first, very different. The first time I went to Moscow to see Cheek by Jowl do a, a production out there. Um, and it was in the, the mid-90s. And I, I sort of thought the founding myth of London is, London's founded on the two, the two great fires, the great fire of London and the Blitz, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what made London what it is. And you read the history of Moscow and it burnt down every 50 years. <laughs> it's <laughs> just like, what? Yeah, so, uh, you know, you can see there would be a slightly different mindset yeah, there. Yeah, it's um, fascinating. I think we, we do, so we do need quite a lot of explanation, I think. Yeah, we do need that. Along with the explanation, there is, it's it's a tremendous vehicle for two really good actors. And yeah. there's three, if you count Luke Thallon as well, who... Yeah, and was, let's, for a moment, let's talk about his yeah. Roman Abramovich. You know, he's got that sort of diffidence that I really associate with Roman Abramovich. You know, you know on the rare occasions that you ever see him speak... Yeah. I mean, obviously, you don't see him much at the moment, but when he owned Chelsea, you know, you you couldn't quite tell if he was deeply uncomfortable or just bored out of his mind. Yeah. And, like, I think he really gets that. Yes, yeah. He's really good. He's such a talented actor, Luke. Thalman, He's terrific. He's absolutely wonderful. And, again, to revert back to what Peter Morgan does so well, you sort of look at this and think, this whole sort of 25-year period in Russian history, it can't just be... Um, Berezovsky, Putin, Abramovich, Litvinenko, and Yeltsin. And then you think, but actually, on a basic level, it really is. Yeah, you know, exactly. All of them They're... knew one another. All of them were associated with one another. All of them were sort of in each other's pockets. And, and you who... cannot conceive of the power yeah. that they hold. Yeah. It's just, it's unbelievable. 
I just, I really liked it. Yeah, so heart, heartily recommended. And a yeah. quick shout out to Miriam Buta's set as well. Oh, which love it. is a sort of casino table come Kremlin mega desk it's come brilliant. cockfighting brilliant. ring. Yeah, you know? it's <laughs> so great. Really good. Well, great. We loved it. We loved it. After the break, we'll be joined by Jamie Parker for his new show, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. And we ask, is he still mates with the other history boys? Stick around to find out. This is Kate O'Flynn, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I am at Southwark Playhouse Elephant, and with me is Jamie Parker, who is starring in The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, the musical. Welcome, Jamie Parker. Thanks for having me. It's a musical adaptation of the original F. Scott Fitzgerald short story, but transposed from the 19th and early 20th century to the later 20th century and to Cornwall, is that right? That's right, yeah. It starts in 1918 and goes all the way through to 1988 over the 70 years of Benjamin's life. Originally it was F. Scott Fitzgerald's short story, which is now in the public domain, so it's fair game for anyone who just fancies flexing their imagination over it. And And the main point about the story, we should say, that what makes it the curious case is... Is that Benjamin is a sort of magical, realistic fairy tale of a character called Benjamin Button who's born as an old man, and as he grows older, he ages backwards and gets physically younger. Yeah. Uh, so you have this innocent soul in an elderly body um, yes. who gradually becomes, I suppose, sadder and wiser, uh, yeah. but younger and firmer at the same time. <laughs> yes, indeed, yes. Is, he passes through the same milestones oh, of yeah. life as everybody does and the same challenges, bereavements, uh, you know, romantic problems, you know, the problems of parenthood, but they're yeah. all the other way around to the way other yeah. people do. When you take on 70 years' worth of an entire life cycle over the course of one evening. The danger is that it's a whistle-stop tour through the greatest highs and lows across a lifespan, and things could be uh, quite generalised. But what we found going along is that the, the more specific we make the crises over the course of the story, then the more universal these things become. Yeah. And I think they've avoided that danger beautifully. It's really, really romantic. Yeah. I mean, not in a mawkish um, overly sentimental way despite our modern cynicism it, it sort of yeah. it cuts through it and it probably like we're, we'll sit in like Grinches out in the in the audience and yes. <laughs> feel your heart grow three sizes and it really <laughs> hurts yes yes but I enjoyed the show very much it didn't strike me as a natural subject for a musical or indeed for transposition to Cornwall between the years of 1918 no I think I think like like a lot of these things I mean a lot of the most enjoyable and sort of imaginatively rich things that I've been part of initially can, can come across as terrible ideas on paper <laughs> or as or as you kind of go well, a lot like for example a lot of great musicals are Les Miserables Cabaret West Side Story I mean yeah. um, so I, I got an email about it and I went okay for a start I had demo tapes to listen to to, to Darren and Jethro's beautiful songs and, yes. and I came to understand that there was a previous iteration of the show that had happened five years ago four or five years ago with just a little five man active, active musician version of yeah. it and now they've amplified it up into a 12-strong actor musician team. It, it, it is pure theatre because it's just rooted in storytelling through words and music. Obviously, David Fincher adapted the story himself and used cutting-edge CGI to, and high-end graphics to, to, to age Benjamin yeah. upwards or downwards. But from, here it's just you and your posture, yeah, really, yeah, isn't it, it? No, yeah, and it's literally it's that storyteller thing of work your thoughts. I mean, we actually had a much more extreme version of the starting costume where it really was like a bag of bones in an empty... In this big, big baggy suit, but we found that it, it was just sort of impossible to swap it out. Right. We realised that we were immediately getting pulled into trying to play the production game. Uh, it, it's a red herring, I think. Yeah. There's, so we sort of we nod towards it, you know, and, and gradually over the course of the first half, my waistcoat will tighten up a little bit, and the sleeves get rolled up, and the collar comes off, and yeah. some of it's posture, some of it's vocal. Mm. It's not a massively sort of athletic set of choices it's just yes it's kind of a fascinating place to stand in the middle of the stage with these 11 other voices around you and they say something they describe the next beat in the story the next change in Benjamin's yes. circumstances or the next change in his in his soul essentially as it progresses over his life this shift and the music does the same thing and, and you stand there and you and you feel and you go oh okay so this is where we are now and mm. and you feel the audience come with us and yeah. i wasn't sure it was it was a bit of a roll of the dice i thought when i listened to it when i read it i went okay it's still in progress hmm. um but it's def it's got something it's definitely got something very very touching and beautiful about it yes. and um 
and and happily it feels like we've we've got it over the line and they're still with us yeah and famously before this you played harry potter yeah <laughs> only the second actor to play harry yes, potter i, I believe did. isn't that right in harry potter and the cursed child um unless which you count was... jim dale and stephen fry ah, uh, as the audio yes books. i mean that was a, an extraordinary thing wasn't it harry potter you know oh, to... it was madness it took uh, was, was it daunting to take that on or, or tell me how it changed your life I mean, it was a bit i mean it, it, like i say i mean sort of this stonking mega success i didn't know any of the details all i had been asked was in principle would you be interested in harry potter in the west end yeah and i just thought that sounds like an absolutely dreadful idea <laughs> yes it sounds awful what yeah. on earth and then i saw the details and it was sonia and colin the producers and I went oh okay John Tiffany and Stephen Hoggart with Jack Thorne on the script. Oh, bloody hell, okay. Yeah. And then you've got Neil Austin on the lights. And just, the list went on and on and on. I went, oh, man, they've put together like a world-class team. Yeah. And then I read it. And again, it just, it had, it was, John said this repeatedly, I think, that, that it, it was a, a love letter to theatre. Yes. They weren't trying to, they didn't want projections they didn't want they weren't they weren't you know they weren't trying to do a live movie and it was very definitely sort of freed from the spectre of the childhood harry wasn't it because this was a grown-up harry yeah with his which own again son, in my ignorance i knew nothing story. about yeah yeah yeah, yeah, I yeah, didn't. yeah yeah well you'd already been to broadway and all over the world with history boys hadn't you just two years <laughs> out of rada so um, yeah so was the sort of clamor and the transfer to broadway of harry potter was that were you a sort of old hand at that something sort of oh this is dead easy I well it's you. very different once you've got family and stuff like that it's right. just it, it's just a totally different uh thing you're, you're uprooting your family for a year and a half essentially you know you have to, you have to get schools involved in the right neighborhood and then suddenly you're into <laughs> school zoning in manhattan <laughs> right which yes. is a rabbit hole it's just much more pragmatic and less giddy sure but uh, less lonely as well and i, and I think I'm, I'm glad that that, that it came along at that stage of life. History Boys was an, an extraordinary phenomenon, wasn't it? To, to, and to sort of step yeah. into that two years out of RADA, that must yeah. have been amazing. It was the most extraordinary cast, though, for that, not just Richard Griffiths, oh, by Francis and Francis de la Tour, yeah. but all the boys, you, Dominic Cooper, James Corden, yeah. Sasha Dewan, yeah. you know, basically the, the sort of 30 to 40-something, <laughs> you know, people who are our leading men now. Um, are you still in touch with any of them? Is there a sort of fraternity co- that comes from being Sam, a history boy? Uh, Sam's coming day after tomorrow. So our That's Samuel. Um, Sam Barnett, which I'm thrilled about because uh, it's been too long. And Sam's definitely the one out of all of them that I remain closest to. It's weird seeing the History Boys grow up. Is it? It's, very, it's really weird. And I've, I've interviewed Dominic Cooper a couple of times, and it's, it's funny seeing him sort of doing grown-up parts now. Well, I think, was, I think it's just we're, we always will be associated with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter how stratospheric James Corden becomes, he's still... He's still going to be he's, a History Boy a, to He's you. still ex-History yeah. Boy. <laughs> It just, yes. you know, it just, and but it's also odd looking back. None of any of it has been a surprise to me, right? Whenever I've seen so and so crop up in whatever, yeah, you kind of go, well, that makes sense. And it was just one of the great things that we had these eight very distinct silhouettes, yes, in the room, and and none of us. There was a lot of competition in the room because we were young actors in a busting hurry in our early twenties, but there wasn't any direct rivalry hmm. because none of us were ever going to be. I same. think we have bumped into each other in casting queues and stuff, but yeah. none of us were ever actually likely to play the same parts. Yeah, is being a history boy and being Harry Potter are they more of a more of a blessing or more of a curse? I mean, that the people are always only a blessing. I think I've, I've never been conscious of being limited by the jobs. I know I'm not alone. That there's sort of a thing that seems to happen. Maybe I'm just superstitious. I don't know, but but it seems to be the way that you 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 get a big job and then you don't work. Yeah, said so, uh, Gina McKee said that after our friends in the north, she didn't get a job for a year after that. Yeah, you know the uh, most yeah. the most fated drama of the, you yeah. know, of its decade. I and I, I did, uh, yeah, I didn't work after History Boys and I didn't work after Harry Potter. I did wonder. The thing is, a lot happened after Potter. The world was changing when we were there, uh, and then we came home. I turned 40 and COVID happens. Yeah. Brexit had happened as we were opening in London. So o- over the course of that job, life changed considerably. Yes. yes. And so what happened after it in terms of, I mean, in the period after Potter was, the, I, I've never not worked that much mm. since coming out of drama school. Right. Yes. But, you know, get in line. Um, a lot of people were in the same boat. Yeah, sure. So I did wonder if there was going to be an element of sort of putting one brick on top of the other, arc coming out of 
the Cursed Child's yes. mega juggernaut thing. And, yeah. and I think there probably has been an element of that. Right. Um, which is probably part of the attraction of doing something like this. Yeah. Like I say, it's the other end of the production spectrum. And there's, yeah. there's no other reason to be doing something like this other than the going back to first principles. And because it's in, it's intrinsically worthwhile. Mm. I think it's beautiful and yeah. I think it's moving and I think it's funny. Yeah. And it holds an audience um, in the space it has to play. Yes. And that's it. That's all it's about. And the thing is, you can be playing Hamlet at the National or you can be in the biggest budget thing ever but yeah. ultimately it's the same trick you're trying to pull off yes it's yeah. just a lot of distractions and there's no distractions on this one that's true that's very true brilliant jamie parker thank you very much thank you that was jamie parker speaking to me from the southwark playhouse elephant coming up after this short break we'll be reviewing a midsummer night's dream at the glow but this will give you just enough time to hit follow and give us five stars we'll see you back here in a minute Hi, I'm Marisha Wallace, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. So, A Midsummer Night's Dream at the Globe. Most people know what it's about, I think, probably. It's, you know, it's the story of uh, four lovers wandering about in a forest, having a terrible time, yeah. and everything being all right in the end. I mean, let's face it, I mean, there's fairies, there's, there's trickery. There's, there's fairies, you know. there's trickery. It's, also, it's usually it's quite often wheeled out as a, a sort of cheery, light summer entertainment. Um, yeah. Whereas, actually, I think it's a... I have always thought it's a fairly dark tale. It basically suggests that you will never know your mind, you will never know your, your true emotional feelings for someone mm. because they can be warped. Yeah. Um, and it is also, not to put too fine a point on it, in the case of Oberon and Shitania, the story of a man who drugs his um, partner and gets to have sex with a donkey. Yeah. <laughs> so the summer romp like it that. ain't, really. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? It's well, sort of, it's seemingly appropriate for children. The way that, uh, I think it's Helena of, of the Four Lovers is treated, and then Hermia, actually. Yeah. It's absolutely bloody outrageous. Absolutely. I mean, all the women get a pretty sort of raw deal out of this yeah. uh, out of this, this story. But it's that's one of the reasons I, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed this production. Yeah. I, I tend to sort of think if I never see another Midsummer Night's Dream, I will not feel I've uh, lost out on anything. I always think that. It was the that. first play that my parents took me to see at the Open Air Theatre. I then had to review it for 13 straight years at the Open Air Theatre because <laughs> they did it every year. And those are, then there are all the other dreams that all the other theatres do. And... Uh, but this was a play that I thought absolutely got the balance. This was a production, rather, that I thought absolutely got the balance of the comedy and the darkness yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and also, as is quite common at the at the Globe, there's a fairly fluid attitude towards gender, which plays very well into this play's idea that everything is mutable. You you don't know who you're going to fall in love with, yeah. uh, you know, or you don't know who you, you could wake up and suddenly find that everything has changed in terms of your orientation or you yeah. know, your your affections. So I thought it worked it worked really really well. It features the Globe's artistic director Michel Terry as Puck who is who comes out of the ground Screaming <laughs> with a really, face like a green scab. I know um, it's so funny. She's sort of she's really unpleasant, yeah. isn't she? And it's, it's just, there's a real kind of like Loki-ish vibe going on with her. That's and a very good description. Utterly yeah. untrustworthy and ultimately cowardly, but yeah. genuinely hilarious. You're right, and I mean, and Puck time. does share DNA with Loki. You know, the sort of Definitely. trickster, the prankster gods, absolutely, you know, or yeah. the prankster um, spirits. Certainly. So yes, that 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 makes absolute sense. And her um, costume, as well as you mentioned, it kind of very much leans into the Green Man thing, which yeah. which is sort of the vibe of the whole show, but but sort of anchored by just that face, actually, that weird, weird face. Yes, and it is a play about mischief and about mm. uh, and about toying with people's emotions and with their with their feelings in in, in a quite an extreme way. Quite often the lovers can be quite annoying. Yeah, um, I mean, they are quite thankless, especially Helena. Helena is a really thankless role. She's basically massively screwed up. Yeah, she But is. I think Isabel Tom, yeah, is it? So like right. really pulls it off. Who played Joan, uh, who is who is um, gender fluid and, ah. and played uh, Joan in I, Joan, at okay. Shakespeare's Globe. So that adds an interesting uh, dimension to it. Also, as Hermia, you have Francesca Mills, who is a fantastic actor. Yeah. She's also, she has a chondroplasia. All the lines that are levelled at, at Hermia by her former lover suddenly have this really savage new resonance. Yeah, yeah, I'm exactly. My scalp is tingling how, remembering. Yeah, there were a couple of moments where, where I went um, on Monday night and the audience were sort of like going, oh, mm, 
Yes, you know, yeah. when because he was being absolutely vile. Yeah, and I mean the the, the two um, ostensible men, Lysander and Demetrius, Vinnie Heaven and Sam Crera or Crera, they're fairly sort of androgynous in this as well. Yeah. So there's yeah. there is a sense that it's not obviously cisgendered from yeah. the start, which it normally yeah. is. Yeah, uh, so here you do feel that anything could happen, and and it, it does. You know, yeah, the really, absolutely. Really extreme things do happen to the humans in this, I uh, did, or to the, the, yeah. the middle class humans in it. Well, and yeah, extraordinary exactly. things happen to the working they class. They do. Yes, I too. mean, I thought you know Mar- Mariah Gale playing Bottom, uh, or as uh, as she says, Nicola Bottom in yeah. this, and as Baton. she says, I prefer to be known as Baton. <laughs> yes, uh, is just brilliant, just so so funny, but also her movement is great in this. Is sort of the way she she sort of prances about as Bottom, and then is kind of. I mean, almost literally horsing around yes. as bottom as an ass. Her movement, like her donkey, is so, so good. But she also expresses the kind of absolute terror of being dragged off by the fairies, which yeah. would be deeply alarming. Yes, absolutely <laughs> Really, terrifying. really brilliantly. Yeah, you know, she's yeah. sort of trying to kind of maintain some kind of calm. But mm. actually... Something really scary is happening, and it really feels like that. Yeah, while yeah. also being very funny. I thought and she she's was great. She's quite touching in it as well, yeah. isn't she? That there's quite often he's referred to as bully bottom, and quite often yeah. he's this bomba- bombastic character. Whereas here, she's sort of deluded bottom, yeah. but she's quite sweetly deluded and wants to do the best. For and the, there's a there's a moment that actually almost made me tear up, like right at the end of. Um, uh, the moment when she she sort of reappears and her ass's ears are gone and and she comes and finds the other rude mechanicals and sort of starts sort of telling them what happened but then realises that it sort of just sounds so mad she can't say anything. Yeah. And she says, and I can't remember the line, but it the, there's a moment where she's sort of looking into the distance and she says, uh, you know, something happened that I, I can never tell you. Mm. And it just felt so much like she's referring to, to love and being loved. Yeah. And she's feeling the loss of it. Yes. Because that's what she just felt with Titania. And yeah. it, it just, it really, oh, it really touched me. I found mm. it so sad. Yes. It was lovely, I yeah. thought. There's moments here, uh, quite often one of the problematic things about the play is how silent Titania is uh, and how yes. silent Hippolyta is. Yeah. And here... They they refer to that. I mean, they draw attention to the fact that yeah. that uh, and Titania looks pretty damn pissed off by the, by yeah, the end of the play like, as you really would be. Yeah, she's like really quite furious. Yeah. and it's just like, hang on. <clears throat> Usually, she just sort of goes like, "Oh, you Ooh. must tell me how this wondrous things happen." How I was she's found with like, these mortals lying on the ground. You yes. yeah. are going to have to tell me. Could answer some serious questions. This, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How yeah. this has happened? Yeah. And, you know, Oberon. He knows he's got the kid, but he knows he's in real. He's trouble. in real trouble. Absolutely. Uh, it's not just bottom. Quite a lot of the mechanicals are played. By women or identify, you know, female identifying yeah. characters here. Again, it's it's quite nice. It's quite fresh. It's quite refreshing. Yeah, it's one freeing. of my one of my major problems with the dream is that it ends and then it goes on for another forty <laughs> minutes <laughs> because know. basically everyone wakes up in the forest with their right person. And you think, oh, good, it's done. But then the mechanicals have to do their. God awful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then you quite often have the, oh, should we do our prologue or should we do our Bergamot or, or the prologue. The prologue. <laughs> yes. As, uh, yes. as, uh, bo- as Baton prefers yeah. to pronounce it. Yes, it's yeah. Funny. But I've, I've quite often had to restrain myself from standing up saying, please don't do the Bergamot dance. <laughs> don't do the Bergamot dance. Um, but here it moves fairly speedily. The, yeah. the sort of last bit, last chunk of the play, it's it's very funny. I mean, it's quite hit or miss, that, that comedy of the, the mechanicals. And it's also quite punching down all the sort of nobles are being really horrible. Well, they're, to, taking to the, the they're taking the piss out of the mechanicals. And here they sort of cut back on the nobles' lines and they allow the comedy to sort of play through uh, of the mechanicals. And you also see Batom doing a bit actually really with some with some some skill yeah. and uh, you know making it and then obviously the dying the dying is preposterous but, yes. but the sort of you, you know you have a moment where everything stills and again everyone's looking at bottom and bottom is emoting in a way that really makes you feel something and yeah. i think the tone as you were saying before is really spot on yeah so congratulations to Elle Weil. Uh, congratulations to uh, the musical director as well, because I think the music in this is fantastic. Yes. So composer and musical director. There were a bunch of Americans around me, and they were wowed by the music. And, you know, that is one of the joys of the Globe, actually, is going on a normal night and being surrounded by tourists who have never been before and yeah. never seen it and never seen anything like it and think it is just Amazing! Absolutely, it's yeah. so nice. I t- yes, uh, James Maloney is the name of the composer for this. By the way, let's let's name check him. It's true. Every time I go to the Globe, I think how fantastic it is that it's there. Yeah, you know, if ten years later Sam Wanamaker wouldn't have got 
that no. theatre built on that Thameside no. plot. You know, it would be luxury apartments like yeah. everything else in London. I took a screenwriter friend there years ago and he said it's like watching your, the, your first film in widescreen. Um, <laughs> That's it nice. is totally different. It's a place where, you know, there's there's nowhere for directors to hide. There's nowhere really for actors to hide because you can't do the set. This is a terrific Midsummer Night stream. They've yeah. got a really good comedy of errors, um, which somebody, uh, another critic reviewed for us, but uh, which I caught up on the other week and is really, really, really funny. Right. So I think they're really hitting their they're on a roll this season there. it's absolutely wonderful good I think everyone should, should reacquaint themselves with the globe and if they've never been they should go I mean we're very lucky to have it we really are we really are we're not in the pay of big globe <laughs> <laughs> that's it for this week's theatre podcast Thanks to Jamie Parker for joining us. You can find all our interviews just below this episode, such as with Eddie Izzard, Kato Flynn, Tim Minchin, and many more. And you can find all our reviews and news online at standard.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss a new episode. Nick Curtis and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.